what this summit is about. And so we could not agree more with why we are here, why it's important that we look around the world and see who our partners are. And I have to agree that exchanging contact information during a crisis does not work. What we do in our office, we really try to establish all those relationships with community groups and our partners um, in advance so that we can work together to, to problem solve. So uh, thank you again, Mr. Singh. Okay, just a reminder. Okay, we have our index cards here, okay? Snaps are one awesome thing about these are the breakout sessions you attend. Inspiring conversations you have, memorable activities, affirmations regarding new allies or friends. Put them in the box or outside. And then seeds are one piece of new or renewed learning that you will take with you and share with others. A new or renewed learning that you will use in your work or that you will explore further in the future. Um, so our, our final keynote. So we've heard from government, we've heard from uh, anybody who knows me, knows that I love anything that says Legal Defense and Education Fund. Um, so we are now going to hear from Ms. Cheryl Lindbergh's song. Um, I've had the pleasure and the honor of speaking with her on the telephone. And I actually recall when this shooting occurred and, and similar to what other people have expressed here, you just can't believe it. You, you, know, you, you, you just can't believe it. So, I don't want to belabor, I want to, for you to hear from her. Um, Ms. Cheryl Lynn Birdsong is a woman of faith, strength, and purpose. She faces life's challenges head on with an overcome, overcoming and conquering spirit. Since the murder of her husband, Ricky Birdsong, former Northwestern University to head basketball coach by a white supremacist on July 2nd, 1989, Cheryl Lynn has become a national role model for putting tragedy into victory. She is the founder of the Ricky Birdsong Memorial Race Against Hate in Evanston, Illinois, which each year for the last 15 years brings nearly 5,000 people to Chicago's North Shore to celebrate diversity and respect for all people. I'm very honored and much gratitude that, that you're here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us.
were middle school students, elementary school students, high school students. And um, I think we could do a better job. You know, we have all these common core standards and teaching about, you know, AX plus Y equals C. But what about, you know, stop bullying this person? I mean, how can we do a better job of, of teaching the kids, you know, stop bullying, stop talking about, um, you know, so and so because he or she is different? And then, what about better training for the teachers who sees that kid who is always by himself looking down? know something's going on in his, in his world, in his head. And I believe that the Virginia Tech shooter had written some kind of alarming paper that one of his professors had read and, and didn't really do anything. And look at Hollywood and, you know, I watch Scandal. <laughs> But what really from, I'm talking about big problems require big solutions. So what is even Hollywood doing and, you know, social media, you know, we talked about Stormfront, I learned about that this morning, but what about other, you know, websites and just social media and the music that our young kids um, listen to? Why can't messages about tolerance and acceptance and, and all of that, they need to come in, in powerful waves like that. So anyway, I go in my classroom every day and um, the first day of school, I, I share my story, I show a video and I share my story and from that point on, I'm just planting seeds of love. I tell my kids every day, I love you. I left a note on the board um, for today that, you know, my expectation that at the end I said, I love you. I love you all. So anyway, um, okay. So I, I go to my speech here. And I, I just came to share my personal story and I guess it begins on Christmas Day in 1972. That was the day that God presented me with a wonderful gift of a human being named Ricky Birdsong. We were both 16 years old, juniors in high school, and just spring, I mean, Christmas break happened to end up at a mutual friend's house. One of his friends was going with one of my friends. And we just ended up there and had a good time. First time I'd ever seen him, heard of him. And when we were out in the driveway getting ready to go out separate ways, he asked for my phone number and I gave it to him. <laughs> <laughs> and he called me that night and for the next 27 years, we talked every single day. Before that year was up, we already were talking about getting married. I was already practicing my name, Cheryl <laughs> Birdsong. <laughs> and so we did get married seven years later after we both graduated from Iowa State University and such was the humble beginnings of our pursuit together of the American dream. Seven years after that, we um, started our family. We both were teachers and, and coaches. At one time, we were both assistant basketball coaches at the University of Arizona. And um, a little time after that, Sabrina, Kelly, and Ricky Jr. were born. 
So Ricky coached Division One basketball in several different places, and eventually we ended up at Northwestern University. And after four years there, he became the Vice President of Community Affairs for the Aon Corporation. <laughs> he was a great friend, my best friend, um, a, a wonderful husband. He brought the paychecks home, and I spent them. <laughs> Um, he was an exceptional father. When he came home, the kids just acted like I didn't exist. And we were living the American dream in Skokie. Just beautiful, quiet, peaceful, serene neighborhood. Then, on July 2nd, 1999, our American dream became the American Nightmare. Ricky had asked me to go for a walk with him. And I said, sure, but I need to go and do this. So he said, okay, well, while you are out, I'll take the kids and we'll go out jogging, which is something that he did on a regular basis. He would jog and the kids would ride their bikes. So, Sabrina was 12. She probably looked at me being on and him being on as an opportunity to do whatever she had been thinking about trying to do that day. So she didn't go outside with um, Ricky and Kelly and Ricky Jr. She stayed home. But my husband and Kelly and Ricky went out and one block from our home, a 21-year-old member of a white supremacist hate group called the World Church of the Creator drove by them and sprayed bullets at three of the most dearly loved people in my life. And I still shudder when I think that all three of them could have been harmed or killed. So, at least one of those bullets struck Ricky, and it was the type of bullet that exploded on the inside. And so it obliterated all of his internal organs. And I will never forget, um, after they worked on him at Northwestern Hospital, they finally, brought me and those who were with me in the hospital room to see him, which I thought he was still alive. I never prayed so hard in my life. But I, I remember seeing, and I'm sure they did the best they could to let me see him. And just the blood was everywhere, just dripping everywhere. It, it was just a horrible sight. And <clears throat> one of the hardest things I've ever had to do as a mother was to go home and tell my three children that their father had died. And their cries of horror, disbelief, and confusion is something that I will never forget. And helping them to understand the reason behind this murder, as I later, you know, came to understand a couple of days later, and to cope with their loss and to keep a heart of love towards all people, free of anger and hate, that was my full-time job. So my family and all who knew him lost a treasure. Ricky was the kind of person that brought light and life and energy wherever he went. He was always the life of the party. His smile was contagious and his laugh lifted you up. But most importantly of all, he really, really genuinely cared about people. When he was working at Aon, he would sometimes ride the train and then walk from the train to the building. 
And there was a homeless man who would always be in a particular spot on Ricky's path. And Ricky got to know that man and eventually helped that man to get a job in the mailroom at Aon. Lots of stories that I could tell you. Stories that I didn't even know about that in various places where I would be, people would come up to me and tell me what Ricky had done for them. He, 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 he was a treasure. Um, and he was passionate about helping young, at-risk boys have positive alternatives and teaching them how they could be successful in life. And several of his basketball players are still in communication with me and just thank me every Father's Day, every one of my birthdays for how Ricky inspired them and how he was more than a basketball coach to them, really helping them to be the men that they are today. Um, when he was killed, he was just about finished writing the manuscript for this book, Coaching Your Kids in the Game of Life. And he had so many ideas and dreams, um, things that he wanted to do and accomplish, and uh, it, it was just a loss. So when people cleaned out his office, they brought home to me something that God really used to help me. And it was really Ricky continuing to coach me because he coached me, he coached the kids, he was just a coach. So one of the things that came from his office was his favorite quote that he carried from state to state, office to office, and it always would have a prominent place in his office. And it said in big, bold letters, and when I saw this <coughs> from the box that was given to me from his office, it just really was my wake-up call. It said, I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. So my number one response was a resolve not to remain a victim, but to become a victor over my circumstances. My faith in God guided me and sustained me. I was encouraged by an Old Testament scripture which promises that God will turn troubles and sorrows into opportunities for hope. And so I began a journey from tragedy to victory. I decided that I was not going to be bitter or defeated by evil acts and hatred, but that I would overcome evil with good. I chose to have forgiveness in my heart for my husband's murderers, all that played a part in it, and to pray for all such people who were disillusioned, estranged, and have no understanding of the power and love of God. With tremendous support from my family, friends, church, and the Evanston Scope community, I established the Ricky Bird Song Foundation and I, I ran across, as I was cleaning out my basement, I ran across um, our original brochure. And the foundation had a vision, mission, values, and goals that promoted reconciliation between, between races, champions diversity, and builds respect and esteem for all human life. And I believe that the almost 10 years that the foundation was in existence, I believe that we, we did touch some, some young people's lives. That was our focus, to um, concentrate on young people. And one of the foundation's greatest legacies is the Ricky Birdsong Memorial Race Against Hate, 
which 15 years since Ricky's death is still going strong under the leadership of the Evanston North Shore YWCA, which Eileen Heineman in the back, my son's um, middle school principal, is um, big, a big part of that. I always say that if what happened to my family could have happened anywhere in the United States, it could not have happened in a better place than in Skokie. Just the community response. I remember um, maybe it was a day or two after Ricky was killed, I just happened to look out of my living room window and there was about 20 people outside on the sidewalk. And I just went out there to speak and they told me that they had decided to get together every night at the spot where Ricky was shot to just take a walk. And those walks continued every night for at least a year, at least I can't remember them. But it was just an incredible community response of where you know, my neighborhood had all kinds of, of, of people. But people just decided, okay, we need to get together, we need to learn how to understand one another, get to know each other, relationships. It's all about relationships, <coughs> building relationships. And I think that what we did in that community taught a powerful lesson to the children. I know it was very empowering for my children. So it's things like that in just the way they came together and supported us in, in so many ways, it, it was just incredible. I've taken many um, airplane flights throughout my life, and this was not a part of my notes for today, but I just have to share it. Last night's flight was the most unbelievable, unforgettable flight that I've ever had. Um, got on the plane. First of all, it wasn't the first flight that had been arranged for me. So this was the second um, um, reservation. So I get on the plane and there was a gentleman already sitting in the seat where, next to where I was supposed to sit. And uh, I got there, and he got up to let me sit down and, and everything. And so I had on an orange top, and he had on orange pants. So he said, I guess it's an orange day or something like that. I said, yeah, right. So put my seatbelt on and everything. And um, I was really ready to take a nap, but some just told me, you know, just say hi or whatever. So I said, um, is Chicago your, your home or is Atlanta your home? He said, Chicago. What about you? I said, well, I live in Atlanta, but I'm just going to Chicago. He said, oh, okay, well, why, why are you going to Chicago? I'm going to be um, speaking um, somewhere. Where are you speaking? UIC. What are you speaking on? <laughs> so I said, a hate crime summit. He said, we looked at each other and both of us knew. He said, what's your name? And I looked at him and we both knew and I told him my name. He grabbed my hand and he started to cry. So, he knew who I was and I knew who he was. So this is who he was. About a year after Ricky was killed, I was speaking at Trinity Lutheran Church on Golf Road in Skokie. After I finished speaking, I was standing at the back and, you know, just kind of talking to different people, you know, 
and I noticed this man standing over to the side, and I knew that he was waiting for the crowd to die down so he could come and speak to me. So he came over to me, and he said, I am so sorry for your loss. He said, Benjamin Smith came to me a few weeks before he did what he did, and he told me that he was going to do something. I, I can't remember the exact words. It was that man sitting next to me on the plane last night. He said that he has never been able to just I'm not going to say forgive himself because I told him that night at Trinity Lutheran, he asked me would I forgive him. He said that he felt so bad that he didn't take Benjamin Smith seriously. That he, he didn't do it. He, he told me, he said, ah, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. And um, we had an incredible conversation on the plane last night. It was incredible. But it just, in, in one way that I want to share here, it just speaks to how, you know, you can't take things lightly when somebody comes to you about something, you know. Just take things seriously. So, um, back to my notes. And I'm wrapping up. One thing that I heard over and over again from people responding to the way that Ricky died and that it was a result of a hate crime is that it was so just ironic that he would die that way because he was such a relational person. They said if his shooter had known him, he would not have been able to pull the trigger. Ricky was kind, gentle, compassionate, and would give you the shirt off his back or the shoes off his feet. He was big on building relationships, and I believe that relationship building is the maximum hate crimes buster. <laughs> and we have to do more from the classroom, homes, wherever, building relationships. It has to be purposeful and intentional. How can we create opportunities to build positive relationships where stereotypes can be demolished and understanding developed? I am a prisoner of this hope and committed to doing all I can to put hate crimes to death. God bless you and thank you.
relationships. Challenge yourself, challenge each other. What are you going to do? What are you going to do that's different? Thank you very much for being here today. Breakout sessions are um, in your, uh, in your uh, folders. And um, look forward to our three closing. Thank you.